I, uh, I started out, my intention here was to preach a message specifically on something that was asked uh, to me a while back. Uh, no, you know, they just, they, somebody had talked about house church movements, uh, the house church movement. I don't know if you're familiar with that. I put movements on the title house church movements because I'm aware of several movements throughout church history um, towards that. Um, you know, kind of way of, of thinking. And so this last week, I uh, spent a lot of time just studying out, studying it out, listening to a lot of uh, preaching on that topic, and or not preaching necessarily, but um, people explaining why they do do it that way. And anyway, it kind of led me down just a whole bunch of different avenues and just thinking about this whole subject in general. Um, and, you know, just to give you a little disclaimer before we get to that, I am going to talk about house church, how, the house church movements, but it's going to be a little while to get to that. I feel like I have to establish some other, another point first. Uh, but just to sh- tell you right off the bat, the fact that churches might meet in a house, that doesn't bother me one bit. I think that's great, in fact. I think that's, uh, I mean, if you think about it, we're meeting in a house. <laughs> this used to be somebody's house, right, uh, at some point in time. Uh, when we started at Matt Ross Community Center. I mean, how is that any worse than, than meeting in a house? So the idea of meeting in a house, there's no problem with that. And so, uh, so understand that right off the bat. Uh, but in modern times, now modern, how far back do you go modern? Uh, um, let's include into that postmodern, in the postmodern age. Everybody familiar with what that means? I don't even completely, I guess, understand. How do you get postmodern? Uh, but... We understand along with that has this idea of progressive, you know, people start thinking like, well, we got to do something different. We got to really like think outside the box. And, and uh, so when you, someone says postmodern, they're talking about a time that is just kind of catering to things and philosophies that we supposedly haven't ever catered to, or we have never tried it this way, or we never done it this way. And there's nothing new under the sun, right? To some degree, all everything's been tried to some degree. Uh, but uh, people do have different ideas in regards to the organization and the format, formatting of churches throughout the centuries. There's been a lot of things that have come up. So studying that has been kind of interesting. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about that without getting too off, off topic. But uh, in an attempt to be relevant and you know i think genuinely some people's concept is we need to reach more people okay in this typical modern traditional whatever you want to call it protestant format uh something like this where you meet together in a building and you know the pastor stands up here there's like an auditorium whatever a lot of churches have kind of become cold when it comes to evangelism, right? I think everybody would agree with that. You've all been to churches that meet in this format, and they're just not really doing a lot of soul winning, not reaching people. So I do believe some of these the, the desires to change the way we do church was based off of the fact that, hey, we're not reaching people. Like, we're not really being committed. We're not actually being a family. We're not, in, we're not close to each other. Like, people just come, they listen to, like, a performance, and then they leave. And so there's been one you know, mindset that says, we need to change this. We need to do something differently. And so over the years, they've come up with a lot of interesting ideas. Let me tell you some kind of modern, uh, not necessarily normal or common, but some kind of out, out of the box, like some things that you might see today. Okay. Uh, one is drive-in churches. You ever heard of a drive-in church? Now the concept's been around since as long as drive-in movies has been around. There's been uh, people that have done that kind of thing. COVID made this real popular, right? And I saw a, uh, a church that was advertising their drive-in church and it says something along the lines of, come as you are, but stay in your car. <laughs> the drive-in church. Uh, just drive right through, you know, get what you need. Uh, don't forget to, you know, uh, leave your offering or whatever, <laughs> but drive in church. That's an interesting concept. Here's one. I kid you not. This is not a joke. Bar church. Okay. Now there's a church that their name is literally the bar church. Uh, now I'm sure maybe it's, maybe there's more than one or maybe it's a franchise kind of a thing. But, uh, uh, but that concept of meeting inside a bar is actually pretty common among evangelicals. If you think about a lot of reformed you're probably familiar with a lot of Reformed, uh, you know, Protestants 
uh, are big into drinking. I know that sounds funny as an independent Baptist, but uh, there are church groups out there that are really big into drinking. Now, they're against drunkenness. I don't know how they know when to cross... <laughs> <laughs> when they cross that line, but uh, but they're big into to beer and stuff. And so uh, uh, there's this, there's two quotes on the website to the bar church, two quotes that I noticed. Uh, one of them said this, it said, uh, if Jesus were here today, what type of church would he start? And my first thing, my first thought was like, well, not this type of church for sure. But you know where they get that idea because the people have this mentality like, hey, Jesus sat with sinners and, and he drank, you know, because the Bible says like, you know, John the Baptist neither ate nor drank, and you said he had a devil, but the Son of God comes, and he, he's eating and drinking, and you say he's a glutton and a wine-bibber. And so they read into that and say, see, Jesus even drank a little bit, and he hang around guys that were drinking and, and all that. And, of course, I've preached many times on my opinion on that. I don't think he drank alcohol at all, but um, uh, that's the concept. They're like, hey, that's what he would do. He would just hang out. And they, there was this another quote that they made from some song. I don't know how famous the song is. Maybe you've heard it. Maybe you haven't. Uh, but the song says, a bar is just a church that serves beer. I'm like, I don't think you know what the definition of a church is. <laughs> like, how is it a church, you know, just because a group of people come and they hang out and, and, uh, and, and you know, hey, just add some beer in there and it's a bar. <clears throat> now, that's, that's not the concept of church at all. Now, closely related to that is coffee shop churches. Now, I, I, I got to be honest, I've thought this one through a little bit harder than the other ones. <laughs> <laughs> in uh, Nevada, Missouri, uh, there's a church that, I mean, not a church, well, there is a church, but there's a coffee shop uh, that I've gone to many times when I'm in Nevada, Missouri, for whatever reason, and I don't go through there a whole lot, but, and it's called Preci Precision Coffee. Uh, I mean, now, don't go leaving here and decide to go join the coffee church. <laughs> Precision Coffee, and I just went there for coffee, and it was pretty good coffee, and then I saw, you know, there's this room in the back of the coffee shop, you know, where... I thought, okay, well, they, it's just a meeting place it's where they can meet, but there's all these signs talking about a church, and I realized that that church is somehow connected to that coffee shop, and there's this, this whole mentality of, like, well, let's just do church inside a coffee shop, and that'll be cool, and uh, we'll reach a community, you know, that, uh, that others aren't reaching or whatever. It's really, coffee shops are really weird, and I love coffee, and I love coffee shops, but haven't you ever noticed you either go into a coffee shop that's just, like, full of reprobates, and you just like feel creepy like to even go in there, you know, or you go into one and it's like these real soft, like uh, metro, like Christian organizations, like a lot of times with United Methodist or something like that. And they, 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 I don't know how it works, like legally taxes and stuff like that, but they're actually like a church that owns the coffee shop or something like that. But uh, it just seems weird. Like it's either religious or it's, uh, you know, weird. <laughs> okay. So, uh, uh, but anyway, Coffee shop churches. There's also one called the Foundry in Lenox. Anybody familiar with that one? Uh, is that what it is? A church that meets inside a, a coffee shop? <clears throat> All right. Then there are, of course, online churches where the idea is, hey, just, yes, just do church online. Let's not even meet together. <laughs> like, I don't know. Maybe they meet sometimes. Uh, I'm not sure how that goes. But online churches, uh, of course, there's a donation button, I'm sure, <laughs> on the uh, web page <laughs> where you can donate. All right, there are like, I'm calling it, because I don't know what else to call it, but I'm calling it concert churches, okay? Uh, Hillsong, you're familiar with all these. Like, it's really, that whole church based is based off of, hey, let's get everybody to come to this big concert, and we'll get them all fired up, and then we'll give a little uh, devotion or whatever after the concert. <clears throat> so uh, uh, concert churches has been a big thing. Uh, one that's been around actually surprisingly since the 70s, and I didn't know this, but is the Cowboy Church. You familiar with the Cowboy Church? You go almost every small town community seems to have one. A lot of times they'll be in a barn or they'll be in some kind of a, uh, you know, place where they sell cattle. I don't even know all the, all the names are, but, you know, what's funny about that is I remember when I was uh, in Bible college, I used to work on a farm uh, and also like a volunteer fire department out in this little town called Ebenezer. And uh, that's a great name, but anyway, so, uh, and I used to drive, and I remember this barn, this little property was for sale, it had a big barn on it, and I'm in Bible college, so I'm fired up about, you know, being in missions and starting churches and stuff, and so I, I drive to this farm that I worked on, and every time I went around this corner, I would see this big barn, and I was like, man, that'd be a cool church, and as I drove past it, I realized it was on Farm Road, 
you know, in some number after or whatever, but Farm Road. And so I was like, man, Farm Road Baptist Church. That would be so cool. We'll meet in the barn. Everybody sits on hay bales. And, and I was just like, this would be really cool. And I didn't even re- I didn't know what a cowboy church was, but kind of like my vision there was like what a cowboy church is. It's just like a whole atmosphere and a demographic of people. But if you look into it over the years, they've come to kind of uh, some basic rules of, you know, uh, of practice. I think there's a few doctrines that they all share in common. Most of these have become somewhat of a, non, for obvious reasons, a non-denominational type of setting, okay? And, uh, and uh, the idea is, hey, we just want everybody to, to be involved. Now, here's some code words, all right? Restoration churches, uh, and I'm going to try to explain what I think my understanding of this is, at least. I could be wrong, certainly not brilliant in this area, but uh restoration another uh code word is emerging right an emerging church i think that's different than the emergent church but uh uh then there of course if you see the word postmodern or progress progressive or something like that you know you're dealing with these out of the box type thinking okay now in terms of the restoration movement interestingly some of these these out of the box kind of meeting place actually falls into the restoration. You know, they would claim to be part of the restoration movement where they believe they're kind of going back to how church was. But from our standpoint, it looks like some new fangled idea that's really weird and out there, but actually they think they're actually getting, you know, going back and getting rid of denomination and all that kind of stuff because they say like, well, there wasn't denomination back in the Bible days and all that. Okay. Um, But then you know, you have the progressive emergent church, and a lot of times they're like reaching the people that we don't even want necessarily to come in here, you know, and we're, you know, uh, they're trying to like break, you know, a lot of times their messages are about like uh, environment, the environment and like social issues and stuff like that. They're not even really uh, at this point, you know, sticking with the Bible. They're just using the Bible as a, um, you know, just to just, I don't know, just to just to look like they're a church, I guess. All right, so let me uh, tell you, like, write this out real quick. This is, this is my understanding. This is oversimplification, okay? But this is my understanding of how this works, all right? So let's say you start with a New Testament, the New Testament church model, okay? So whatever we see in the Bible about how the New Testament church met, maybe the first century, okay? Because the the Bible kind of was already completed before the first century. So the, the reality is between the first century and the second century, going into the third century, it's a little bit of a mystery. We don't really know how people were meeting at that time. So I'm going to go ahead and put a question mark here. All right, and so then we have in the first uh, couple, cent- like second century, third century, we have... The Catholic Church, okay? Now, I'm not going to talk about Catholicism because that's not what we're, that's not what we're dealing with right now. However, Catholicism kind of has their own version of um, restoration, and then you got some progressive, okay? So even among Catholics, you have some that are like way out there trying to conform to the social issues and like postmodern. And then you have some that are like concerned with getting back to the way Catholicism was supposed to be. They wouldn't necessarily say in Bible days, but in that first couple centuries where the Catholic Church. All right, so then we have something that comes from Catholicism called the Reformation, okay? Uh Reformation or uh, Protestantism, okay, Protestants. These are people who came out of the Catholic Church and protested the Catholic Church. Now, a lot of them claimed that they were in line with the New Testament and the Catholic Church actually deviated, and so now they're actually going back to the New Testament, which is what this group is, okay? So at some point, and you'll notice this if you study Baptist history and you study the Anabaptists, at some point the Anabaptists became Protestants, like they merged with the Protestants at that time because they shared a lot of the same beliefs. And so I'd rather run with them than run with Catholics. And so they just kind of became something that I would say 
looked a lot like this new uh, reformed movement who, who kind of come up with these traditional you know, things that we see today. There's a pastor who gets behind the pulpit and he's, uh, he's dressed nicely, you know, in a way that maybe would identify him. Sometimes they wore robes or whatever, but uh, that would identify him as the pastor. And they sang songs and they had preaching and it was not too much different than what we see today. Okay. So we'll call this kind of a modern traditional uh, tradition traditional service, okay? Again, we're not, we're not embracing uh, Reformed theology. We're not Protestants. As, as Baptists, like, I don't believe we're part of the Protestant movement. We did, we're not protesting the Catholic Church. We're never, you know, there's nothing to protest. Like, that's a different ball of wax, okay? So um, I'm more concerned about this but right now, most of our practices, even the songs we sing out of the hymnal, a lot of them are more Protestant. You know, these guys for, like Wesley and, and all these uh, uh, we're singing. So we are part of kind of this tradition that has been passed down, okay? Now, from this, we have modern, you know, what, we, what we're doing today pretty much. Like just kind of modern concept of, of getting a building. Uh, that building becomes the church house. We meet, we have this type of a service like we're having. Okay, and then you have all these different uh, restoration ideas where they say like, hey, this, this model's not working and this isn't the way the book of Acts describes it. This isn't the way it was meant to be. We're not reaching people. We're not helping people. You know, we're just having a show and then we're going home or whatever. We need to get back to, you know, to this. Okay, and not necessarily this because we don't know exactly what that looked like for the sake of this this sermon. Okay, uh, but we need to get back as close as we can to to that. And then, of course, you have the um, progressive. Um, concept. All right. Now, I would say that this is us. Right. We're still following this. And I don't see a reason to change from that. I don't see a reason to change from that today. Now, there are some issues that fall into this category that I feel like we as a church have sort of embraced. The idea of small groups, the idea of family integrated, like all these are attempts to say like, hey, the traditional style of church has kind of got off in some ways and it kind of raised some problems and got us away from our main focus and stuff like that. And I'm just talking about our church as an independent church, all right? Let's not call ourselves any names or identify with any groups. As an independent church, we have in many ways said, hey, we need to restore what church was like, okay? We need to uh, realize where we're going wrong in some areas as, a, as the traditional model. And, and our services need to look like this. Um, I, I suppose there are some concepts from the progressive movement that, you know, I don't think we would, like, we're not too concerned about postmodern. I'm trying to think of what could, enter, could have entered in, okay? Well, for instance, like, there are groups that go so far as to say, like, well, in the New Testament, you see no signs of anybody using instruments, right? You ever heard that argument? So there are churches out there that, that won't use instruments, and you'll say, well, what about the book of Psalms? I'll say, that's Old Testament. You know, what about this? That's Old Testament. In the New Testament, there are no examples of churches singing songs. This is the argument that people will say. And so that's, so, so we can't do songs. Well, how about the fact that, you know, they are under persecution. <laughs> you know, they're not necessarily trying to announce to everybody they're having church. Uh, there, there are a lot of arguments you can make to say, like, oh, the Bible never says that you can't play instruments in church. Like, or that all of a sudden the Old Testament way of worship is no longer uh, relevant. You know, the Bible never says that. But some people have taken it to that extreme. We obviously don't do that. We want instruments. In fact, this is an electric instrument. <laughs> you know, uh, some people would have a problem with that. Don't you know? Satan is the prince of the power of the air. And this go uses, <laughs> you know, they're, they're, people talk like that. Uh, they did for a time. Microphones, people, churches wouldn't use microphones because they're like, this Satan is behind the microphones now. I will say, technology, you know, messes up a lot of church services. But anyway, uh, so, you know, what I'm getting at is we're an independent church, right? 
We aren't answering for any movement. We're not answering for any uh, denomination or such. We do want to know what the Bible has to say. We do want to be as close to that as we can, uh, but we have some different, you know, maybe uh, uh, views as to what church to look at. Okay. Now, there are, as independent, as independent Baptists, again, we're an independent church, so we don't have to hold to any model, but as independent Baptists, technically, they've gone pretty much two routes. Okay. One route is kind of the mega church. Um, you know, a lot of churches wouldn't call themselves a mega church because you think that's progressive, whatever. Uh, but, you know, when I was in uh, Oklahoma City, that church ran, you know, 2,000 people. That's, to me, that's a mega church. That's a huge church, you know. And then you got like uh, Hammond, Indiana, and, and places like that that are independent, fundamental. They're not progressive, but they're big churches. And so the idea is bring as many people as you can to church. And, and uh, a lot of times in the independent Baptist uh, circles, this is um, something that is run through Sunday schools. Okay, so this was a lot. A lot of this was pushed by Jack Hiles, and I don't know where he got it from. Uh, I've got a book on my library. It says Jack Hiles Manual. Okay, and it tells you how he ran his church. If you run it through Sunday schools, each Sunday school class is a small group, right? And so the idea is, hey, you got them on your roll, and you know who everybody is, and you call the Sunday school teacher, calls them, and checks up on them, sees if they need anything goes and visits them. If there's a visitor, they're put into a certain Sunday school class that, that fits them. And then that Sunday school teacher goes and preaches to them the gospel maybe on a Saturday or something like that. Uh, and so the evangelism, I mean, everything is done through the Sunday school. Um, and this is the way a lot of independent Baptist churches are run. And then there is a movement, not just the new IFB, although a lot of people like think that they are the first ones to think of this idea, something, but there is a movement that has kind of gotten more into the family integrated model and said, hey, we don't want all the divi- the Sunday school classes and the divisions and the s- super programs. There are some that have embraced a, a uh, simple church model. And, and so, you know, those are basic, those are the two basic, you know, independent Baptist churches you see today. And of course, we're more of the family integrated uh, idea. Now, all this leads me to my topic, which is house churches. And then I'm going to come back and summarize all of this, okay, because it all, it all goes together, okay? But I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about the house churches. I believe there are pros and cons to this concept. Again, there are, I, I say house church movements because there's lots of different ideas, philosophies as to what that looks like and why they do it. Um, but, you know, I, 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 the one, I'm just going to present the biblical model and where somebody could come from the Bible and say, like, this is what we should be doing. I'm just going to present that argument. Okay, so, uh, so house churches, here's the first point. House church, and I can take this down now, but house churches make sense, and I'll, ch- I'll tell you why, uh, what I mean by that. They make sense, and they do have somewhat of a biblical backing. All right, and now, again, when I say house church, I basically just mean a church that's meeting in a house, uh, but that could look different ways to different, different people, okay? But here are some common arguments that people who are sold out on this model of uh, doing house churches, uh, there's their arguments. Okay, number one, they'll say the church is not a building, and so we don't need a church building to worship in, to which I'll say amen. Again, we met at Matt Ross Community Center, okay? Uh, and none of us, I don't think anybody felt like, well, we're not a real church, <laughs> right? Not a real church until we get a building. If that's your thought of what a real church is, then you have a misunderstanding of what church is because a church has nothing to do with that building, okay? And so I remember, when, in fact, when we started this church, and I make reference to it a lot, I know uh, Brother Justin probably knows exactly where I'm going, but Brother Justin, in you know, one of the early days of us starting this work, we were sitting down having some meetings, Brother Austin, uh, uh, Brother Justin, uh, Brother Stevie, uh, there was a couple other guys who aren't here anymore, but they would come, they would attend some of these meetings or whatever. And we would have meetings and we would talk about this. And I don't remember when it was, but I remember Brother Justin talking about, you know, because we're wondering where are we going to meet? What are we going to do for a, a building and all this? 
And he said something along the lines of, now this was before he was into the, like the bushcrafting and the, the, <laughs> the camping and all that. But he was like, I mean, I mean, I'm sure he still liked that stuff, but uh, he wasn't known as that. <laughs> so uh, he said, uh, he said, man, I would rather just, he said, I don't care where we meet. I'd rather just meet on tree stumps in the woods with a bunch of people who actually cared and loved the Lord and wanted to do the work than to meet in a big fancy building that's just full of people who don't want to do anything and they just sit around. And that was kind of like the concept when we started the work. I was like, man, I keep that in mind because that's the attitude that I think we should have. And obviously, you know, I like the outdoors and I have thought many times about, you know, meeting out in the, in the woods, calling it uh, the church in the wilderness. And <laughs> you know, I thought, man, that'd be great. Not very convenient for everybody. Got a got a hike like a half mile to get to the service site, you know, and it's some beautiful landscape, something. I'm speaking your language, ain't I? <laughs> it sounds like a lot of fun. Like, um, I don't think there would be anything wrong with doing that, by the way, necessarily. Okay, I'll, again, pros and cons, and I'm going to talk about why we do what we do today. But so one of the arguments, the church is not the building. I totally agree uh, that the church isn't the building now. Some people go too far. You talk to somebody who doesn't go to church anywhere, and they'll be like, well, I don't need a church because I am the church. No, you don't understand what church means because church, by definition, is an assembly, a congregation of people. Like, you can't be the church by yourself unless you are like got multiple personalities, schizophrenic or something. <laughs> you know, I have a little church service with myself right now where two or more are gathered in my name. <laughs> right, so, uh, uh, you know, that's not how it works. You have to get together with other Christians in a group of people, in a congregation, to be a church. In fact, that whole idea about the church in the wilderness, that was a reference to the congregation in the Old Testament, you know, that, that Jesus was leading through the wilderness. Okay, so the second point, a lot of times people will, the argument they'll make is that this model saves a lot of money if you don't have a building because a lot of money goes into making the payments on the building and, uh, you know, all the other things that go with that. And so, sure enough, uh, I do think about that. I, I think I thought about that more so um, at Matt Ross Community Center. But I, still, I think about it this, in this building, too, okay, because, you know, we're paying rent, basically, to meet in this building. And at some point, you're like, where does all that money go? Like, it's just gone. Like, we pay it, and at the end of the day, we have nothing to show for. We don't own this building or anything like that. And in your mind, you're thinking, man, that's a lot of, that's a lot of money. Well, when we met at Matt Ross Community Center, it was, uh, it was a little bit less expensive than this. But I remember I had this idea. Again, I would be a great candidate to be part of the progressive movement <laughs> because I have lots of ideas, and I love these ideas. Uh, but I usually talk myself out of anything crazy, okay? Uh, but I had this idea... Because we started this ministry with the, with the understanding, hey, we're going to knock on every door in the Kansas City Metro. This is a mission work of Iola Baptist Temple. That's what we started. Our goal is, yeah, we're going to have church service. We're going to meet. We're going to do all those things. But our goal is to go out and knock on all these doors. And that's why we started the work. So I had this idea. Back in the early days, we had a lot of single guys. Now everyone's married and has kids. But we had a lot of single guys. And I was thinking, you know what would be a cool idea? For the amount of money we're spending on Matt Ross Community Center, we could get... We could take one of these single guys and put him in an apartment, okay? And we pay, the church pays his rent. He stays in that apartment. He's kind of like working for the church. He's like in evangelism. He's like, an event, you know, doing an, a, the real work of an evangelist. Uh, not like today's modern churches use the word evangelist. Uh, and we pay for his rent. And what we do is, is while we're living there, we meet in that building and we're not, hey, then they couldn't kick us out of the apartments, right? We'd be like, hey, <laughs> we own this building. We, we pay rent for this building. And then we meet, you know, in that neighborhood and uh, spend however amount of time that it takes to get that neighborhood knocked. And then, you know, the rent's up. And so then we go buy another, uh, we, we put them in another apartment complex or a rental house or something like that. And we do the same thing, and we just keep moving all around the city. Would that be unbiblical? I don't think so. I don't think there'd be th anything wrong with that, necessarily. There'd be some inconveniences, and there'd be some reasons where I think that wouldn't be the best model. But, uh, again, there are zillions of ideas a person could come up with on, on how, where to meet and how, how that looks, okay? And if you don't have money, well, obviously you can't spend a whole lot of money on a building, and so you do whatever you can. 
uh, there are many times, in fact, we had, um, I don't remember who it was, but I, I think I got an idea. He doesn't come here anymore, but um, he was saying, hey, I got this family member, I got this relative, they got some land, and they got like a, uh, a trailer, like a mobile home or something on that land, and I think that they would allow us to meet in there or whatever. You know, a lot of times, churches that get started in the early days, a, a building is actually given to them. Do you know that? Like, a lot of times... It, or they'll, they'll be like, hey, we just can't, like, this church is ceasing to exist, exist. we're going to shut down. You know that a church legally can't take those assets with them. They're nonprofit, and so they have to actually use that to go into another nonprofit organization. So what they usually do is just donate that money or donate that property to, uh, to another group that's wanting to start or something like that. Um, all, I've heard so many stories about that where in the, in, in the initial days, and I believe Iola Baptist Temple uh, no, I think they purchased that property, but I don't know whose it was. Uh, and it was originally a house, I think. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you've been on the Iola property, that what we call the old annex, that was a house. And so the whole church is kind of built around that. There's like the auditorium is built on the side of that. And then the fellowship hall is built on that. So there's like three buildings uh, on that property. And I think the original one was, was somebody's house. Okay. So... Um, does it save money to meet in the house? Well, yeah, for sure. And if you're starting a church, you just go into a town and you're like, we're just going to start a church here. It would make sense to just go ahead and start where you're living or start in whatever house somebody will make available to you uh, just to be able to make that work. One of the arguments is that it's more comfortable for those who reject the traditional church setting. Like people are uncomfortable going to church nowadays. And so uh, just invite your neighbor over to your house for church. That's a whole different thing. They might be interested in that. They might come. I'm not going to really talk much about that because, uh, you know, first of all, church isn't really about our comfort. It shouldn't be about our comfort. And then uh, secondly, like, you know, tough, man. If you don't like the way churches, you still, you know, if you're, if you're committed to the Lord and you want to be part of a church, you, it's not all about what you feel comfortable doing. But anyway, and much of that's the emerging church philosophy, and we're not talking about that, all right? Now let's get into some biblical examples. We're going to spend some time here looking at some examples of house churches. Okay, Luke chapter 22. Luke 22. Starting in verse 10. And he said, let's see here, Luke 22, verse 10. And he said unto them, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall, there shall a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he in, entereth in. And ye shall say unto the good men of the house, The master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he shall show you a large upper room furnished. There make ready... And they went and found, as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. Okay, so we see that uh, the Lord's Supper in the early church, Jesus, I believe that's the first church, right? The 12 apostles that Jesus uh, gathered together. And uh, they meet in someone's house, okay? It's a guest chamber in somebody's house. It's an upper room. That was very common in those days for the, the rooms to be up on the upper level, okay? And so... Uh, uh, that first, you know, that wasn't necessarily a place where they met all the time, but that was the place. They needed a place to meet. They needed a place to take this supper, and so they met in somebody's house. Okay, now look at Acts chapter 1. Could this be the same place when they go into this upper room? I don't think it is necessarily the same place. When they go into this upper room after Christ raises from the dead. Uh, Acts chapter 1, look at verse 12. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotes, and Judah, Judas, the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Okay, so this is where the apostles are meeting after the Lord ascends up into heaven, and they're still meeting together in this upper room somewhere 
uh, where it's a place that they can dwell. Now, I don't know that they're having church services there necessarily, but this is somebody's house, it seems, um, or at least, you know, whatever space that they could all meet together for this time. Now, the uh, other, uh, throughout the rest of the book of Acts, you find lots of people who have what the Bible calls a church in their house. Okay, the church that's in your house. It's a very common phrase that's used. Look at Acts 2, 46. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. So a lot of people will point to that and say, look, they were meeting in, uh, in houses. Chapter 5, verse 42. And daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and to preach Jesus Christ. And so there's something going on from house to house, breaking bread in houses, teaching in houses. Uh, there's something that's going on in this setting. Uh, look at uh, Acts chapter 16. Acts 16, verse 14. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, uh, which worshiped God, heard us, those, uh, I mean, sorry, heard us whose heart the Lord opened, and she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. Uh, so this lady named Lydia is in Thyatira, and she, you know, has the disciples into the house. This is where they meet uh, for this time. Look at, let me see here, verse 40. And they went out of the prison and entered into the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they comforted them and departed. So again, the disciples were meeting in Lydia's house. She made that available to them, a place for them to stay. And so that's uh, where they were. Okay, now let's talk about, again, some of these uh, the uses of, you know, the house, the, the, the church that's in your house. 1 Corinthians 16, 19. First Corinthians 16. All right, so Paul is ending his letter here, and as he usually does, he's like, hey, give tidings to these people uh, we and the, these churches salute you and such and such. Verse 19, the churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you uh, much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. So there's that phrase, the church that's in their house. They salute you as well. Okay, These are those who are in Asia. Now remember, Lydia was from where? Thyatira. Does this sound familiar? Like, a, churches that are in Asia, Church of Thyatira, you know, Church of uh, Laodicea. Let's see, let's see if Laodicea is in here. Uh, Romans 16. Romans 16, verse 3. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well-beloved Apennatus, who is the firstfruits of Achaia unto Christ. Skip down to, uh, let's see here, chapter 16, 15. Oh, no, that's, that's 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. Back to 1 Corinthians 16. And verse 15 says, I beseech you, brethren, ye know the house of Stephanus, that it is the firstfruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Okay, so there's another church uh, or another household that's being addressed here. And um, let's see here. Did I already read 19? The churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. How about Colossians 4? This is the one I was talking about. This, I think this is Laodicea. Uh, Colossians 4, verse 
Colossians chapter 4. Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. And look at verse 15. Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea, in Nymphus, in the church which is in his house. Now, do you remember, again, in the book of Revelations, uh, uh, letters are written to the seven churches in Asia Minor, okay? Laodicea is the last church that's mentioned there. This is a physical church, but here he's talking to a specific household in Laodicea, and he's talking about you know, the, church, and the church that's in their house. Now, does that mean that every believer that lived in Laodicea had to go meet in Nymphus's house? Like, I don't think that's necessarily what's going on here. But there are people in all these households who are part of this church in that area, okay? So, uh, Philemon, let's look at one more. Philemon. But, I mean, you, you certainly can't say, if somebody tells you, hey, it's biblical that churches meet in houses. Well, sure, there are, there are people who met together as part of the church in people's houses, okay? And did it save them money? Was it convenient at the time? Yeah, I'm sure you could say all those things are true. I forgot what I was doing. Philemon. Titus and Philemon. 1-3. Grace be unto you and peace. Now, let's see here. Philemon. one well, I don't know. There's only one. Oh, maybe it's. I think I think it was supposed to be Philippians. I'm sorry. Uh, was it? Oh yeah, you're right. You're right. Okay. Uh, and to our brother, uh, to our beloved Aphia, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. Okay. So that concept of a church that's meeting inside the house, it's there. Of course, you also could say that it's part of the church, but they just happen to be meeting, you know, living in these people's houses. Because see, in our society, like each family represented here has their own house, pretty much. Like I, I can't think of really any exceptions. Each family represented here, you've got your own house. Wasn't necessarily the case in Bible days, right? A lot of times they didn't, even Jesus said, hey, I don't have a place to lay my head. Like he's traveling around, he's going everywhere. He can't go home every night to his, to his house. And so, they would meet wherever they could meet. And so a lot of times, you know, where do we find these members of the church? Well, they're at so-and-so's house. You see what I'm saying? So that is part of the church who's meeting in somebody's house. But really, I mean, quite honestly, is that any different than what we got going on here? You know, we got family members who are part of this church. Well, guess what? You have a church in your house. But you're not a church. You're not an independent body in and of yourself. You're part of this church. But... Whenever you're at your house, there's part of the church that's in your house. So you see what I'm saying? Like, there's no reason to read all those verses in the Bible and act like, see, you got to be meeting in a house. You can't be meeting in a, in a building. It's not, it's not biblical, okay? So meeting in a church house. Now let's talk about that. Meeting in a church house or a church building is obvious. It would be, it would, it would be silly to say that it's not scriptural. It, is, it also makes sense, and it, all, it also has a biblical backing, okay? Jesus met with his disciples. You know, you say, oh, yeah, he met in the upper room. He's in his house with his disciples. Yeah, well, it also says that he met in a temple, right? Daily in the temple and in every house. Well, if you're going to say every house, then you also have to say in the temple. They met in the temple. Well, we don't have a temple today. Okay, but that doesn't take away the fact that they would go to this temple, which was understood as a Jewish, uh, you know, that's like the central meeting place of the Jewish faith, okay? God actually told them that you're going to take, you're going to take these, uh, these pilgrim feasts where you actually have to go to Jerusalem. You have to come to the temple as part of, your, uh, part of this celebration, okay? The disciples continued this practice after the resurrection, and again, daily in the temple and house to house, like they're also going to the temple as well as meeting in houses. And uh, we also see that it was part of their, I'm getting ahead of myself, but it was part of their practice to go to the synagogues. And I'll talk about the synagogues here in a minute. Uh, but they, every Sabbath day, you'll see the apostles, hey, as was their custom, they went to the synagogue, right? And there they disputed with the Jews and all that. That's where Jews were meeting. They didn't go to the temple every single week. 
Because, you know, many of them live far away. They couldn't travel that far to the temple on a regular basis, and God never asked them to. But they would come together on Sabbath day, and they would have meetings in their community at the local synagogue, you know, until that time where they would all go to the temple. But that's a whole other uh, issue that the church doesn't have to deal with today. Like, we don't have that temple. We are the temple. Okay? Unless you're talking about Iola Baptist Temple. All right, that's a bad joke. <laughs> okay, so, uh, uh, all right, so... Um, Acts chapter 12. No, I think that's supposed to be... I think that's supposed to be Acts 2. It's supposed to be... Uh, it's supposed to be Acts 1. <laughs> I don't know what I did there. Acts 1. Okay, starting in verse 12. That's what it is. Acts 1, 12. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olive, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they went in un into an upper room where abode both Peter and James uh, and John. And that's not what I was looking for. Uh, maybe somebody can help me out. Where does it say that there was 120 15. meeting together? 15? I just didn't keep reading. The number, oh yeah, there you go. There stood up Peter in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of names together were about 120, okay? So in the beginning of the book of Acts, you know, you can say like, well, they're in this upper room, which is basically like somebody's house, their guest chamber. You could say that they were, you know, meeting house to house and all this kind of stuff. Well, he just stood up and addressed 120 people. Now, what does that sign say up there, the max capacity of this? Hey, that says that we could get 95 people in here. That, that, could you imagine 95 people in here? Like on a regular, if we have 30, pe if we have 40 people in here, like it looks packed, completely packed. Okay, could you imagine trying to get that? Which I don't even know what you know who came up with that number, how they ever got that. But could you imagine trying to get 120 people? In? If we had 120 people in Iowa, at Iowa Baptist Temple, if you ever been to the congregation, uh, now we have had. 200 people in there for a youth rally. Uh, they, it was standing room only. Like, they were out in the back. There were some people that weren't even in there. We had people sitting up in the choir. It was completely packed. You couldn't get another person in there. And I think we had around 200, like close to 200 people in there. So that's a, well, 120 people is a lot of people. And what I'm saying is, do you want 120 people meeting in your living room? <laughs> so, uh, so obviously, you can't say that they weren't meeting in buildings, you know, in, in larger rooms or, or some kind of place that wasn't somebody's living room, you know, <laughs> okay. Uh, and again, synagogues. Synagogues were a common meeting place. Um, now, did synagogues cost them money? Yeah, it did cost them money. Now, they were also under a system of donating and giving tithes and giving alms and giving this uh this you know this money which goes all the way back to the old testament when the temple was built you know how much money they brought to the temple they were they were giving tons of money they were giving their properties they were giving their uh, belongings and all this kind of stuff so that the temple uh could be built and so it took a lot of sacrifice uh to be able to do that. look at luke chapter 7 now, again, some people are able to contribute more than others. Some people maybe have a property that they're getting rid of. A lot of churches have these stories where somebody just gave them this property or something like that. It didn't necessarily have to cost them, you know, a huge amount of debt. Which I think is one of the, the big problems. Like if you're talking about, hey, a lot of people spend too much money on the church buildings. I would totally agree with you because if you go into some churches, it looks like you are in some kind of a super fancy building. You know, like how many millions of dollars did you spend on this, this facility? I, I, I don't know. Like some people, that means a lot to some people, right? Hey, do your best. Uh, I think about Haggai where it says, hey, how long are you living in your sealed houses and you're doing all this? And yet the house of God has not been built. Of course, that was a reference to the temple, the rebuilding of the temple. Uh, but the concept could play out in the work, in the life of Christians today. Like, hey, we're all worried about our houses. And, and hey, quit asking me to give money to the church. I got my own things, my own house that I'm building, like, all this stuff. Well, don't you think it's a good Christian principle to say, like, well, I should have something that doesn't benefit me and my house and my needs, but go straight to the Lord and to the Lord's work, right? Well, that was kind of the idea of even these... Uh, 
these, um, what's the word, synagogues. Okay, so look, Luke chapter 7. Now, when he had entered all his saying, I'm sorry, and when he had entered all his sayings in the audience, am I reading that right? And when he had ended, thank you, ended all his uh, sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum, and a certain centurion's servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him uh, the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying uh, that he was worthy for whom he should do this. For he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. Now this rich, this wealthy man had said, like, what can I do for the nation of Israel, for, these, for God's people and the people that I love? I tell you what, in our community, I'm going to put up this synagogue so that they have a place to meet. Now, obviously, God wouldn't want anybody doing that, patting themselves on the back and wanting them to get glory to themselves because they did this. But I'm just saying, like, they referenced this man as some great thing that he had done because he had allowed them to have this sanctuary where they can meet in, like this synagogue. And uh, interestingly enough, if you study out the synagogue, you can actually point to a few verses in the Bible where people get up to teach and they're in front of everybody and they're teaching them. And, uh, and, and you can look at some uh, archeolo archeological findings and some buildings that remain to this day that are the remains of synagogues from years and years ago. And interestingly enough, they don't look too much different than a modern uh, type of a sanctuary where you got places to sit, sort of like pews, and then you got a, a pulpit where they actually stand up and they're above where they can teach and preach. And so, like, I don't think it's that absurd to make the, the claim that the synagogue, that was the place in each community for these local assemblies of, of, of uh, Jews to meet. Probably when Jews started getting converted to Christianity after all this preaching, what do you think they did with the synagogues? It probably became the church house. That's probably where they met on a regular basis to have church, okay? And so there's certainly nothing wrong with that. And I'm not claiming that everyone who meets in a church for, uh, uh, meets in a house for church makes that claim. I'm just saying, hey, it's also plenty fine to think about having a building where we put effort into upkeeping and we put money into beautifying it and making a nice place for people to come. Like, that's not a waste of money, Okay. That's not any more of a waste of money and then uh, Mary opening up an alabaster box and pouring this perfume on Jesus' feet. And, some, and what does Judas say? You could have sold that and given it to the poor. I mean, you know people make that argument all the time. All that money you're putting into that building, don't you know you could be helping our community, feeding the poor, you could be uh, you know, paying people's rent, you could be doing all this kind of stuff. No, I, I like the concept of giving something to the Lord. Now, obviously, I think we should be putting a large amount of our money into evangelism. We should put a large amount of our money into things that are, are helping us to go out and, and, and you know, um, investing into soul winning and doing the work of the ministry. But also, I, I, I think it's good that we put a lot of our money into even times of fellowship. Okay, so again, what a lot of people are saying, hey, why we have to do church different, man? Because people are just going to church, they're listening to preaching, and then they're going home. So we need to come up with a different concept. How about we invite them into our living room and we just get to know each other. We have a barbecue, right? That's church. Well, we could do that as a church too. Like our church services are like this. And then we get together and we do something somewhere else and we get to know each other's needs and we pray for one another and we do all these kinds of things. It's fulfilling the same thing, you know what I mean? It's just, but there's certainly nothing wrong uh, with having a book. Now I want to give this last point real quick. I know I've went a little bit long on all that. Okay, so... I brought in the very beginning, I brought in this, all these crazy ideas that people come up with, like, how, what could the church look like? You know, how could, you know, online church, bar churches, I mean, all these crazy ideas because people have, and then I talked about the house church, which in and of itself is not a bad thing. There's nothing wrong with a church meeting in the house, so long as it's actually a church meeting in a house and not just some people who uh, met together in a house and called it a church, you know what I mean? There, there are certain things that make a church a church, okay? So the third thing I want to share is this. Here are three things to consider. This is just a conclusion, okay? Here are three things to consider when deciding, hey, let's change. You know, because 
every once in a while you get this idea, like let's do something a little bit different than the traditional model. I feel like we kind of did that with KC Mission and to begin with coming out of Viola and starting this, like it was different than the model that has been passed down to me as an independent Baptist. Um, I don't think it's diff I don't think it's outside of the scope of the Bible, but but that's that's one of my points here, okay? So here's three, here are three things to consider. When you come up with this idea of how to do church and you think, well, maybe we need to get away from what's been passed down to us. Because certainly there's things that have been passed down to us that we've gotten rid of. We're, we are an integra family integrated church. That's not what was passed down to me. I was big into the Sunday schools and the bus ministries and all that kind of stuff, okay? Uh, but here are three things to think about when you are tempted to break away from the traditional model, okay? Number one, these ABC, okay? Number one, authority, authority. Make sure that this is being done under the right authority. And it's not just a group of people who had this harebrained idea, wanted to do something neat. Maybe they have a little bit of a rebellious nature to them. And they're just like, you know what? We're just going to start house church because that's the best way to do it and all this kind of stuff. Under no authority, right? Why, why is authority important? Look, why does there have to be qualifications of a pastor? Why did that pastor have to be ordained by other men of God who were ordained to that church. You see what I'm saying? If you cannot convince me that the Bible doesn't continue this, uh, this handing down of authority. The church of Jerusalem, you know, they send out the apostles to, that are going to go preach the gospel to the Gentiles, all this. Uh, and then they go to these churches and then they start these churches and then they ordain under the authority of that church that, that sent these men out they ordain elders to be over all those, those different works. Like that's just how the Bible model is. There's authority that's passed down. So somebody shouldn't say, and I listened to some guys, some, man, what was it one guy said? Like uh, he said, well, you need to have a pastor. Okay, if you're going to start a house church, you need to have a pastor. And he was coming up with all these different ideas of how you can get a pastor, you know. And one of them was just simply like if somebody, uh, somebody in, your, in your group just has that, has that desire or whatever, like, I don't know. But ultimately what it, what it came down to was that church that was started ordains that pastor to be their pastor. Wait, no, 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 that's not, that's, that's not authority. That's like the, that's like, a, I don't know what the word is. I don't want to use subservient, but you know, that's, that's the opposite. That's the, the guys voting on their authority. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's not how authority works. Authority passes down. Okay, so that's not a church starting another church. That's some people deciding to be a church, and then they say, hey, we want you to be our authority. I'm going to tell you, that never works out well, <laughs> okay? Because the people, the, the ones that's in authority, the, the authority are the ones who said, hey, we want you to be our pastor. They're going to run that pastor and tell them what to do if that's the case, all right? So, so that's not how it works. But another, another thing they said was, well, just get somebody who went to Bible college, who wants to be a pastor or whatever, and they can come be our pastor, right? But again, it had this idea of, you know, hey, we are the ones who decided we wanted this church, and so we will ordain this person to be, to be our pastor. And that's not how it works. Okay, so the way it works is a church decides to plant another church. Now, if that looks a little different than the normal model, that's fine. They still have the authority to do that. Okay, that's the first point. The second point is this, the biblical relevancy. Okay, the biblical relevancy. Now, we spent some time talking about that. Somebody says, let's say the pastor, he's got the authority to do it. He's already the pastor. says, hey, we're going to start this church over here, but it's going to meet in a house. All right, we don't want to spend money on a building and all that stuff, but we'll start this church, and they're just going to meet in this house. Well, you have not only the authority, but you also have biblical re relevancy. I already showed you, like, that's not, you know, outside of the biblical model that, w that we see. Um, and so we have, you, you want to make sure that you have some sort of examples that aren't just, like, way out of uh, the idea. So, I mean, somebody could try to claim... Jesus sat down with people that were drinking alcohol and, you know, he was a friend to the sinners and all that stuff. Therefore, we have biblical precedents to go and to, uh, uh, to start a church in the bar, okay? They say, we have some biblical uh, pre re relevancy. No, no, no. I'm not talking about taking one little example out of the Bible and trying to build this whole system off that one example. I'm talking about, is there a consistent ecclesiology, like an idea of the church a doctrine or theology of the church 
that you can, you can point to all through, it's consistent in the Bible and say like, well, this is the way God wanted it to be done. And this is what we're going to do when we start this church. Okay, so you need authority, biblical relevancy. And the last point is convenience. Now, I already said convenience isn't the main reason to have a church. Like, I, you don't just like, well, it's just not very convenient for me to drive so far away. So I'm just going to stay here at my church. No, no, no. That's, I mean, look at the Bible. Like I said, they, you know how long people, I mean, let's say you live in the Bible days. Let's say you live 10 miles away from the place where you meet. But you had to walk that on foot. Anybody want to guess about how long it takes to walk 10 miles? You hike. How long do you think it would take to walk 10 miles? I would say, what's that? I would say, okay, the average person, let's just say 20-minute miles. Okay, If you're walking 20-minute miles, that is three miles an hour. Okay, So three hours and then some right, to, to get there. And, and we complain about having to drive 45 minutes. I mean, I'm not saying we. Obviously, you guys do it on a regular basis. But people are like, oh, 40 minutes to drive to church? That's too far away. Yeah, well, would you rather walk three hours? <laughs> you know what I mean? There are times in communities where people didn't have that luxury that we have to be able to just jump in our car and go to church. But you don't say, like, hey, there's not a church within X amount of radius, and so therefore I guess I can't go to church. I'm just going to do it this other way. No. Here, there are lots of things you can do. One thing is move. <laughs> you can move to a place where you're, the, the church is, is nearby that you want to go to. Okay, uh, so convenience isn't the thing that should be the driving force. But if you have a church is being started under the right authority and there's a biblical precedence, there's a biblical relevancy, then you could look and say, well, okay, now, all right, I have the authority, have the biblical relevance, but why are we doing it? Like, why are we making this change? Well, it better be out of convenience, you know, and not just because, hey, I just feel like doing something different. Like, I just, I think it would be cool to meet in the woods, so let's go start a church out in the woods, right? Is that really convenient? Is that really the best thing for everybody in the congregation and best for our, uh, our soul winning efforts and best for all that? And so, uh, you know, the sacrifice, the, the sacrifice is important. Like, we should be willing to sacrifice. What do we need to do, Lord, to, uh, to worship you? We're going to your house. It's your church. We want to do it your way. Okay? Then that's not about convenience. But we certainly want to make it as easy as we can for everybody to be ministered to and to, to get all the aspects of church, to get the worship in, to get that discipleship in, uh, to get that fellowship time uh, that we need with our brothers and sisters. Like, there's tons of things that we can do to make sure we're getting all those things. And so what is most convenient for the church in, in regards to, uh, to getting all those kind of things? So there are some ideas we might have that are a matter of convenience, you know, and, uh, and, and, you know, maybe a little bit comfortable, maybe a little bit better lighting or a little bit, you know, uh, who knows that why, why there could be some changes. And you're like, well, that's not the way we've always done it. That's okay. That's not necessarily bad. It's not wrong to think outside the box. It's not wrong to come up with another idea. But why are you doing it? And under what authority are you doing it? You know, that, those are the main things. And so, you know, I'm thankful for this church. I don't know what the future looks like. Well, we move into, uh, I say we, <laughs> will you guys move into a, a building somewhere? Maybe somebody will donate uh, their, their property. Wouldn't that be nice, you know? Or we just run out of funds and say, like, hey, we got to go meet on tree stumps somewhere. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that wouldn't be wrong. Don't leave the church because you're like, well, this doesn't look the way I want it to. Okay. But it would also be weird to think that you have to fit into some kind of a mold just because, like, it seems like the cool thing to do. Everybody's doing it or, or it's just convenient for you. So, all right, I hope that made sense. And I just wanted to talk on that subject for a little bit. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your church. We certainly don't have any desire to look at other ministries and condemn them or to criticize them. Uh, that's not the purpose of this tonight. And, and uh, is, if anything, Lord, I want to just look at what we're doing and make sure we're, right in the right, we're on the right track and also prepare for the future so that if there are any changes uh, that come, that we will stop and think about why those changes are being made and if they're being made under the right authority, Lord. But first and foremost, we want to worship you. We want you to be glorified in your church. 
your church is not about us it's about you and so uh, we want to do things the best we can to please you i pray that you help us do that give us wisdom and uh and help us to uh to follow uh, your word to the best of our ability in jesus name i pray amen all right let's stand